The accomplishments and dedication of these individuals has given America the spirit to take us through the best and worst of times. It is the talents and desires of these men and women that has provided us with an American standard of excellence. Tonight, America's Heroes relives the excitement of Secretariat as Telly Savalas recounts the legend of Big Red. O.J. Simpson brings us the results of a national poll of the best and most bizarre football players of the decade. Tennis is supposed to be a fun sport, but for kids, the fun has turned to pressure and even suicide. America's Heroes reports on this growing concern. Lee Majors looks at a frightening new technology that could create a generation of computerized athletes. For Mark Fittrich, 1976 was like a fairy tale. Then the bubble burst, and now he's back to chasing a dream. Joe Piscopo talks about sports and humor. And Joe Don Baker gives a stirring portrayal of Olympic gold medalist Jim Thorpe, one of the great legends of America, all tonight on America's Heroes. Hi, I'm Joe Theismann, and welcome to America's Heroes, the Athlete Chronicles. Heroes. Webster defines them as people who display courage and daring. That's what tonight's all about. Athletes who have the courage to try and be the best, or who dare to chase a dream. We'll see them on both the bright and dark side of sports, and hopefully we'll have some fun while we're doing it. You know, heroes come in all shapes and sizes. Many of America's heroes are just kids. A few weeks ago, for instance, 15-year-old Carling Bassett took the queen of women's tennis, Chrissy Everett Lloyd, to three sets before losing. Someday, Carling will be a champion, and she just won't get there by accident. It'll take hard work, and more hard work. Maybe even most of all, learning to cope with the pressures of playing big-time tennis. Sometimes pressure results in a person even exceeding their own performance expectations. Sometimes its results are explosive. You can't be serious, man. You cannot be serious! That ball was on the line. Shock flew up. Everyone knows it's in, in this whole stadium, and you pull it out? Uh, tennis, when I was growing up, was more uh, enjoyment, more for a pastime. Uh, the tennis today, with uh, the amount of money and the big business that tennis has become over the past 10 years, uh, is directed more and with a push from the parents to, uh, towards their children to become uh, professionals at an early age. And I think, in a sense, maybe some of the kids are, are missing a little bit of, of what, uh, what it, what it, how much fun it is to be, uh, to be a teenager, to be little. I've seen too many uh, young players actually turned away from, from, par from tennis because the parents have pushed them too much. I felt more pressure playing in junior tennis than I did when I turned pro. As an athlete and a father, I worry when the race for number one turns the best of times, childhood, into the worst of times. Jennifer Amder, a champion at 12, a suicide at 17. When she was winning, the world was great, tennis was great, but she couldn't stand losing. Is this what happens when parental expectations outstrip a child's ability? Frustration at eight, burnout at 10 over the hill and still a teenager. These kids aren't playing. They're fighting for their lives. It seems to me that uh, a child, unless they're very exceptional, uh, before the age of 10, 11, 12, uh, should not be put under any pressure at all. It should be a learning experience and one where the child is enjoying themselves and doing the recreational sport that they're involved in. It's, it's a very difficult situation whenever the pupil makes a mistake in a, in a tournament match. They immediately look towards the coach or the mother or the father to have some sort of communication there. Well, I tried, but it didn't win. Unfortunately, you're going to be faced always with the fact that the parent may have not achieved for themselves in their life. And then the coach, of course, has a different attitude because he's looking to have a star so that he can attract other people into his coaching classes. The Nick Boletari Tennis Academy in Bradenton, Florida, is a flagship facility for coaching champions. From around the world, a hundred kids as young as eight flood the courts, going for number one. There is a hurry-up atmosphere. Mistakes are corrected instantly. You're doing great. Good. No, you hit down. I don't like that. Get under the ball with the racket head and finish. But Nick Boletari says a big problem concerns parents who insist the pressure is positive. Here a mother scolds her daughter because she is not trying hard enough. I'm real happy with the way you've been fun. Because you know, even more He said all you're doing is just messing around. 
The only type of pressure that, you know, I would apply would be that they're expected to go out there and try to do the best they can. Well, I think uh, pressure is, uh, is, is productive and it helps, uh, helps anyone adjust and, uh, and improve and, and be successful. I think, it's, I think they have a direct relationship between success and pressure. There are certainly many positive elements to the pressures that go into training a young tennis player. Um, what we're concerned about uh, in my work are the negative effects of that pressure. Um, how, uh, what the binds are that, that that young person who is not at that age a fully evolved uh, personality with, with, a, with a strong ego like an adult has w without the equipment that an adult has, how they cope with that. Keep your racket up higher. Susan so Sloan is a voluntary star on the fast now track. Here. She has the finest high-tech coaching, Nick, here in Florida. And back home in Lexington, Kentucky, Fritz Now, the man who started her. Two coaches, one goal. Susan says she wants to be number one. Good reaction. That's it. Come on. Come on. All right, last one. Good. All right, give her a little break. I like it a lot down here, and, um, you know, I like Nick, and, um, he helped, he's helped me a whole lot, you know, when I've been down here. In some ways, I feel like I took part of her childhood away from her, making her be on the court four or five hours a day when she was seven, eight years old, and the pressure was great. We thought the pressure was uh, enormous getting to the top, and then we found that it's, it's a whole different kind of pressure at the top, and you always wonder what it'll be like in 10 years, so, you know, what, what the effect of all the pressure will be. But uh, as long as they're handling it at the time, uh, I don't worry that much about it. Right down to the pose, five years ago, Jennifer Amder had the same happy outlook as Susan Sloan, but for Jennifer, it ended tragically. A year ago, she put her father's shotgun to her head and pulled the trigger. It was the end of a happy family. When she was young, when she was about 6 through 12, um, she was subjected to playing about about six hours a day daily and she didn't mind that that much she enjoyed it she she liked to play she was doing well she was uh, winning her tennis tournaments and i think after about 12 and she became 13 14 and she started to slip a little when the competition uh, started to get a little rougher her father wanted her to concentrate on tennis and he said you're going to play tennis and you're going to be a great tennis player and that's all there is to it. Now Susan Sloan is winning. These are her trophies. This is her room. Susan leads a double life. Tennis champion focused on number one. And in Lexington, Kentucky, a schoolgirl at home with her books. Her parents worry about maintaining the delicate balance between the two lives. But Susan's always handled the pressure. I felt like uh, really well. And, and, and I think part of that goes is that the way that we have tried to handle it at home. We've enjoyed watching her play in matches and... Uh, I guess, really, she's always done uh, well in tournaments, you know. There's very few tournaments that she's uh, been in, I guess, that she hasn't done very well in. Unfortunately, in, in most sports, as in most things in life, there is only one winner in an absolute sense. When you have a tennis match, for instance, only one person can win it. What happens to the lives of all the other kids? We have a responsibility for those of us who work with young kids who are being trained to be professional athletes, to also prepare them for the world okay. as, uh, as it might turn out if they're not number one. When you go back home, you know what you're gonna do? You're gonna work just as hard when you go back home with Fritz. It's gonna be more hard work, trust in all of us, and all you have to do is play tennis, okay? Big kiss. Okay, all right, here we go. There's a lot of hard work down the road, and in four or five years, Susan Sloan can play Wimbledon, and like 17...